Professor Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings is one of the most remarkable works of fiction of the century. And I'm going to start with one or two questions about possible source material. For example, um, I thought that conceivably Midgard might be Middle-earth or have some connection. Oh, it is. They're the same word. Most people have made this mistake in thinking Middle-earth is this particular kind of Earth or is another planet and, uh, you know, in the science fiction sort, but it's simply an old-fashioned word for, the, for this world we live in, as imagined surrounded by the ocean. It seemed to me that, that Middle-earth was, was, in a sense, as you say, this world we live in, but um, this world we live in at a different era. Well, no, at a different stage of imagination. Uh, but this is interesting because in The Lord of the Rings, um, particularly in the appendices, you go to great trouble to get your chronology exactly correct with respect to the four ages that you yeah. write about, yeah. but you make no attempt at all to tie this up with time as we know it today. Why is this? Because it would have been impossible. Because it was completely interfered with and, uh, and trampled one in a free invention of history and uh, an incident to one's story. Nevertheless, despite what you've just said, it seems to me that one could place most of the action, if not all of the action, within a fairly definite sort of time. It won't really work out, you know, either paleontologically or archaeologically at all, actually. I mean, and you can't really relate the land masses I described them satisfactorily to the land masses we know now. Nor, of course, can you uh, really have such a sort of mixed culture as I describe, which includes tobacco umbrellas and, uh, and other things to what little is known of, uh, of archaeological history. I wanted people simply to get inside this story and take it, uh, uh, in a sense, of uh, uh, actual history. It seemed to me that to be cut off by a vague ab abyss of ages had exactly the same effect as you get in a scientific story when you go to some remote part of the galaxy. They don't really explain how, but you get the sense of being far away, that's all. In a possible world, but far away. This is the same sort of thing in time, isn't it? Oh, yes, but in uh, what one might call science fiction, the authors seldom go to the trouble, anything like the trouble you've done, in tying this imagined world so closely to the world as we know it. Because so much of this is very close to what we know, I won't say today, but in the recent historical past. Oh, yes, it, re it, it resembles some of the history of uh, Greece and Rome as against the uh, perpetual infiltration of people out of the East, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, yes it certainly does that. But then, of course, a <laughs> poor man who building a story has to build it out of some of the things he himself knows. He doesn't rush around to Roman history and go and see where, where that happened. But, I mean, if he's uh, been brought up, as I was, on ordinary history, and uh, on his reading, that will be the material out of which he constructs. I've yeah. been interested in the fact that many of the names of which you have created, thousands in, in the book, I mean, literally thousands, are very close to Norse legend names. For example, Gimli is the name of, of the ah, Hall of Gold. That's another it? point, yes. This particular lot of dwarves, as I call them, came from the extreme north of my geography. And therefore, in translating, as I explained in the, in the section on translation, uh, the kind of language they came up against there would be of a northern kind. The dwarves, you remember, are represented as extremely secretive people and have private names in their own secret language and public names like, like gypsies. Well, therefore, I gave the North actual Norse names, which are in Norse books. That's quite different. Not that the, my dwarves really are at all like the dwarves of... Uh, of Norse imagination, but there's a whole list of rather attractive uh, dwarf names in, in one of the older Hedaic poems. I'm afraid I simply begged them. But not only in the dwarves, though, but among the descendants of the elves, the race of Numenor, it seems to me that one or two of the names relate to other things. You speak of the two trees of Valinor, Lorelin and the Telperion, if my pronunciation is anything like Laurelin, that. Laurelin and Telperion, yes, the golden, the golden song and the, uh, and the, and the white uh, silver. Have these, are these in any way reflections in your world of the, the great world tree, the Norse world tree? No, no, they're not like it. They're much more like the, uh, the, the trees of the sun and the moon. It was covered in the Far East in the, in, in the great Alexander stories. Trees play a very important part oh, throughout yeah, yeah. The, the Lord of the Rings. For example, well, the, the Malon trees in Lothlorien and the white tree of the citadel of Minas Tirith. Oh, yes, they're all descendants, yes. These are trees that are more than trees because they oh, are yes. symbols uh, of great importance. Um, is there something in your own life, in your own background, 
To, They're not to... symbols to me at all. They don't, <laughs> I don't work in symbols at all. Other people can find that they are symbolic. They may be symbols in my mind, but they're not symbols to me in my conscious mind at all. I'm entirely historically minded. Well, this is true, perhaps, but nevertheless, yeah. you use um, the white tree of Minas Tirith as a symbol of lordship, of kingship, do you not? Oh, um, well, yes, yes, an emblem, certainly, yes, yes, yes. But not symbolic of anything more than... Well, what are the leopards of England symbolic of? I, say, I take your point. <laughs> now, the, the rangers, they protect men and hobbits from Sauron's servants, but particularly they seem to have a fondness for the Shire. Have you a particular fondness for these comfortable, homely things of life that the Shire embodies? The, you know, the home and pipe and fire and bed, the homely virtues. And haven't you? <laughs> Haven't you, Professor yes, Tolkien? Of course, yes, 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 yes. You have a particular fondness, then, yes. for hobbits? That's what I feel, in, I feel at home. I, the, the Shire is very like the kind of world in which I first became aware of things. Very like. Which was perhaps more poignant to me because I wasn't born in it. I was born in Bloomfield, in South Africa. I was very young when I got back, but at the same time, it bites into your memory and imagination, even if you, even if you don't think it has. If your first Christmas tree is a wilting eucalyptus, and if you're normally troubled by heat and sand, then to have just at the age of imagination is opening out, suddenly find yourself in a quiet Warwickshire village. I think it engenders a particular love of, of what you might call central Midland uh, English countryside based on good water stones and elm trees and small quiet rivers and so on. And of course, sort of rustic people about. At what age did you come to England? I was opposed when I first landed on about three and a half. Pretty poignant, of course, because you see, one of the things why people say they don't remember is because it's like constantly photographing the same thing on the same plate. Slight changes simply make a blur. But if a child's had a sudden break like that, uh, it's conscious. What it tries to do is to um, fit the new memories onto the old. I've got a perfectly clear, vivid picture of a house, but I now know that it's a beautifully worked out pastiche of my own home in Bloomfield and my grandmother's house in Birmingham. Because I can still remember going down the road in Birmingham and wondering what had happened to the gallery, what had happened to the balcony. So constantly, I do remember things extremely early. I can remember bathing in the Indian Ocean when I was not quite two, and I remember it very clearly. I'm going to return again yeah, also to yeah. this, this business of memory and, and, and um, yeah. looking back a great distance. Let me turn to another subject for a moment. Um, Frodo accepts the burden of the ring. Yeah. And he embodies, as a character, the virtues of long-suffering and perseverance. And by his actions, one might almost say, in the Buddhist sense, he acquires merit. He becomes, in fact, almost a Christ figure. Why did you choose a halfling, a hobbit, for this role? I didn't. I didn't do much choosing. I wrote the hobbit choosing. All I was trying to do in the role was to carry on from the point where the, where the hobbit left off. Well, Therefore, I got hobbits on my hand, didn't I? Indeed, but there's nothing particularly Christ-like about Bilbo. Oh, no. No, no. It seemed to me strange that this small hobbit from a small and I shouldn't and say that he was shark. Christ-like. I think as a person, but, uh, but of course he has some, some of the features of Christ. I guess accepting of a, of Perhaps a burden. Perhaps I've exaggerated. A burden, accepting of a burden, but because he... But in the face of the most appalling danger, he struggles on and continues and, and wins through. But that seems... Well, I thought it was more like an allegory of the human race. I've always been impressed. We are here surviving because of the indomitable courage of quite small people against impossible odds, jungles, volcanoes, wild beasts. They struggle on, almost blindly in a way. Frodo had very little idea, really. Of course, he, by the time he came to the end of the quest, he was beginning to understand things very much more. I thought the wisest remark in the whole book was that where Elrond says that the... Um, the wheels of the world are turned by the small hands, while the great are looking elsewhere. And they're turned because they have to, because it's the daily job. Did you intend, in The Lord of the Rings, that certain races should embody certain principles, the elves' wisdom, the dwarfs' craftsmanship, men, husbandry and battle and so forth? Didn't intend it, but when you've got these people on your hands, you've got to make them different, haven't you? Well, of course, as we all know, ultimately, we've only got, uh, only got humanity to work with. It's the only clear we've got. And, and, of course, any races you make, if they're speaking and thinking, are, what, taken from certain parts of humanity, as one knows it, with slight alterations of, of emphasis. That's all you can do, isn't it, really, ultimately? Because the elves are simply, uh, in its sense, expressions certain, not really wholly legitimate 
desires the human race has about itself. We should all, or at least a uh, large part of the human race, would like to uh, have greater power of mind, greater power of art, by which I mean that the gap between uh, the conception and the power of execution should be sh shortened. We should like that, and we should like, of course, a longer time, if not indefinite time, which to, to go on knowing more and do, making more. Well, therefore, we make the elves uh, immortal in a sense. I had to use immortal, but I didn't mean that they were eternally immortal, that merely that they are very longevity, and their longevity probably lasts as long as the inhabitability of the Earth. The dwarves, of course, quite obviously, uh, couldn't you say in many ways they remind you of the Jews? All their words are Semitic, obviously, and constructed be Semitic. There's, there's a tremendous love of the, of the artifact, and, of course, the immense um, warlike capacity of the Jews, too, which we tend to forget nowadays. Or, uh, or hobbits are just well, rustic English people, made small in size because it reflects the uh, general small reach of their imagination, but it's not the small reach of their courage or latent power. Um, you're obviously intensely interested in age for its own sake. I mean, Fanghorn, for example, and the Ents are, are, are the eldest. They have been in existence longer. Tom Bombadil is described, in fact, is he not, as the eldest? Well, he's, of course, a very odd character, but uh, we won't uh, interfere with you now. You were asking about age. It, it, age as such. You're very in, in antiquity. You're greatly interested in long life, in longevity. The Eldar's descendants all have this gift of longer life. Could you expand on that? Well, that's different. Long life, that's, that's, that's purely, that's, uh, that's what's... That's oneself, that's because it's, a, it's an added power in this world. Also, if you are an intelligent and artistic person, it gives you more time, both either to perfect your work or else to, uh, to, get, uh, or to do more. That's rather different to the, uh, to the appeal of antiquity itself. I love history, I, uh, and I, I always feel you, even when you walk into a room, you really want to feel you ought to know the history, but not only the room, but the people. Uh, we walk in uh, with all this tremendous history behind us, but if you're writing a story which you know you're going to come to the end of that history, the history is always backwards, isn't it? Did you evolve a system for naming these races and therefore their histories and alphabets, literature and so on? I didn't evolve it. I merely used what I knew. But uh, that is a rather difficult question, really. But uh, every human being, at least every human being who has gifted at all in that way, has a, what you might call his own native language. That's quite distinct from the, the first learnt. What we call a native language is your first learnt. But every human being has an, an individual linguistic character, as he has an individual face, colouring and body. And I think, therefore, you find that people have what I we should call linguistic predilections. But, of course, like one's physical characteristics, that shifts a bit as you, uh, as you grow and also as you have a, uh, more experience. Well, the language I've entered tried to fit my actual personal, linguistic predilection or pleasure. Well, now, obviously, from history, those two languages have got to be uh, related. They're, they're quite different. All you do is you, you have to posit a purely invented original form or original sound scheme. And then you have to make uh, language A develop certain sound laws and come to B, and uh, uh, certain other ones produce B. They will then be related, however little related they seem, but it will have that sort of feeling. So, therefore, if you have, for the purposes of the plot, or purposes yes. of some part of the book, yes. to invent a new name for a new character, if uh, you consciously say to yourself, um, in Quenya, his name will be so-and-so, but in Sindarin, his name will be this. Yes, you do have that. In the first test, it has to sound a nice name to me, even if I don't know what it means. But then you, of course, come across this unfortunate fact that if it very it doesn't always happen that if you... Uh, then uh, work that those same elements with the same meaning into the into a name and it doesn't always come out as a nice name in spite of that so then you have to have to have to give him another name or do something about it yes it's a it's a minor technical craft actually well it's an interesting technical Princess. craft because you you do it with equal success when you name unpleasant characters like orcs because <laughs> all your unpleasant characters yeah. are instantly identifiable as unpleasant characters the minute one reads their names Yes, I suppose they would. You wouldn't like to think much of a chap called Ooglu, could you, no? Yet dwarves, although they have names composed of similarly uncomfortable consonants to, to, to the English ear, don't the names are, are not unattractive. No. Immediately they're attractive. Yes. And this seems to me one of the great strengths of the book, amid this enormous conglomeration of names, one doesn't get lost. 
No, At well, least after think. the first reading, after the second reading of the book. Well, he does need an extra. I'm very glad you told me because I gave a great deal of trouble. Well, you were must, you see. My things, I did try to use the languages which I did understand, uh, which is, after all, the primary and most important of all cultural penitentiaries. I you tried to use them for that purpose, to characterize. Also, of course, it gives me great pleasure. A good name. I always, in the writing, always start with a name. Give me a name and it's, it produces a story, not the other way about, normally. Of the languages you know, which were the greatest help to you in writing The Lord of the Rings? Oh, no. Yes. Well, because I studied trying to invent languages almost at once, because the uh, uh, same way that I, my reading is, uh, of myth has been disturbed, because I never hardly got through any fairy story without wanting to, um, to write by myself. It, it's perhaps an, an added discipline to trace back anyway to sources in a work of this sort. But do you trace in the languages you invented more to Scandinavia or more um, or later things like Middle English or? I don't know. No, I think, uh, of these sort of modern languages, uh, I should have said that uh, Welsh was always attracted to me by its style and sound more than any other. Even though I first only saw it on coal trucks, I always wanted to know what it was about. It seems to me certainly that, that um, the music of Welsh comes through in the names you've chosen for mountains and for yeah. places in general. Yeah. Do you acknowledge this? Yes, yeah. very much. But a, a much rarer, but very potent uh, in front of myself has been Finnish. Now, women play very little part indeed in The Lord of the Rings. Eowyn is, lit is almost the only woman in the book who shows any sign of sexual awareness at all. Did you deliberately exclude sex from the book? No, but after all, these are wars and, uh, and a terrible expedition to the North Pole, so to speak. But um, other writers have occasionally allowed their characters to digress, <laughs> if it be digression in this way. Surely, uh, uh, there's no... Lack of interest, is it? I mean, I should... Oh, it's not a case of lack of interest at all. Wouldn't you have thought that, uh, that Galadriel... Every, every character is tempted at some point. Wouldn't you have thought Galadriel's temptation and what she says about herself is uh, significant? Yes, I think so. But um, there is always... It's Isn't always that? at one remove. I don't know how to explain it. I know that um, how one reviewer explained it. <laughs> he says it's written by a man who's never reached puberty <laughs> and knows nothing about women except for a schoolboy. And all his, all his characters, all the good characters come home like happy boys, safe from the war. I thought it was very rude from a man as far as I know, his childless, to, to writing about a man surrounded with children, wife, daughter, grandchildren. Still, it isn't that. That's not the reason. Only because it's equally untrue, isn't it, that, uh, that it's a happy story. One oh. friend of mine said he only read it in Lent because it was so hard and bitter. To turn to a practical point. How did the Lord of the Rings develop from The Hobbit? Because clearly it developed. Oh yes, of course The um, Hobbit was successful. Naturally I was pressed for a sequel. I looked for the only point in it that showed signs of development. So I, thought I thought we'd choose the ring as the key to the next story. That's, well, that's the uh, mere germ of course. Yeah? Then when I saw, of course, that if you're going to make a... I wanted to make a big story, I felt it uh, got to be the ring. No, it's not a magic ring. I invented that little rhyme. I'm in my bath one day. Now, this, this germ, actually, of course, is, is also present, isn't it, in, in many mythologies? I mean, in Scandinavian mythology, there are the rings of power, are there not? Yes, yes, there are. It's yes, guarded by dragons, is it not, in, in, the ring, in, in yes. Germanic legend? I suppose Smog might be interpreted as being a sort of Fafnir, is he? Oh, yes, very much so. Except, no, Fafnir was a, was a human being, you see, or a being, a humanoid, we say, being that took this form, uh, whereas Smog is just he's, he's pure intelligent lizard. You have a fondness for intelligent lizards. Well, dragons always attracted me as a, 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 a mythological element. Yeah. They seem to be able to uh, comprise human malice and bestiality together, so extremely well, and a so, sort of malicious wisdom and shrewdness. A terrifying creature. Asking how the Lord of the Rings began leads on to this question. They then did you grew. Have... Then grew without control. Without it? control, this is the point. You did not have a scheme. No, no. No outline at all. Well, except that that was a major one, that uh, the, the, the ring had got to be... Uh, I mean, did you know the ring had to be destroyed from the oh, beginning? Oh, yes, 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 that, you see, because Daniel says so quite early. Therefore, at some point, or other, a hobbit has got to make his way to the, um, the 
cracks of doom, obviously, isn't it? That's the only thing. And several times I tried to write that last scene ahead of time. It never, it didn't come out. It never worked. Oh, I had to wait for it to come through. Did you decide right at the beginning that Gollum was to play such a part, or did you go back through the book after and write in the various linking parts you of Gollum? You couldn't get Gollum out, could you? If you think of Gollum's relation to the ring, if the ring is going to be important, then the Gollum business must be uh, important. I liked him better than all the other characters, and much more sorry for him. But, you see, this is interesting because he's practically the only grey character, with the possible exception of Boromir, right through the book. And Denethor, yeah. And Denethor, yes. The others are almost completely black and white. They all have their temptations, actually. Yeah. They all have their temptations, but nevertheless, the moment you've established your character, um, your reader knows what his, his own personal character is. Oh, He's yes. going to be a goodie or a baddie. Yes, yes. Well, of course, yes. One uh, knows that isn't generally true. I have to simplify a little, really. Well, that's why I think Gollum is so interesting, because one, you know, he, he almost repents at one point, doesn't he, where he sees Frodo. Most, to me, the most poignant, the oh, yes. of the whole story, the most poignant moment of all, because uh, uh, it's, it's so terribly true. It's the good people that do the damage so often. It was fans, Sam's suspicious faithfulness was, was very much justified, which ruined Gollum. You see, that if you mm -hmm. go a long, long way in wickedness, then comes your chance, which you can't therefore demand that it should be made nice and easy at that point. It's going to be probably very sticky, the last chance. And it was too sticky for Gollum, because I spent a lot of thought about it. Because he grew on me. I mean, I almost could see Gollum. Where I've been uh, most yeah. criticised by certain people, and where I think I'm the most right, is making point of fact, though I do praise them for seeing it, is that photo actually failed. The thing that people, some people have said about it is extraordinary. You would have thought in this age, when we are, we are now faced with a with the absolute certainty of pressures which can't be resisted. People would, have, would, people would have realized more clearly than they ever did before that uh, the motives which would go into such a situation are, are, are so important. It's very rash to put yourself in a position you know to be too powerful for you. That's presumption. If you go in with good motives and then land in a position which you can't face up to, then that's up to the government, isn't it? Yeah, some people have been very angry about it. Sort of people who uh, uh, deprive a man of his citizenship he came back after being uh, brainwashed and a ratty or give him something away, I suppose. That's a sign of mind that is still a bunch of such. It's true, yes, yes, yes. But you find that your correspondents, in fact, um, c complain a great deal about certain incidents in the story, or have complained. I, I once said, and I think it's roughly true, that if I should listen to my correspondents, every part of the Lord of the Rings is a failure or it's, a, or it's only weakness. On the other hand, there's another list which every part of which is particular strength. <laughs> at what point, I'd like to know, if you can judge at all, did the book take control of you? Long before I wrote The Hobbit and long before I wrote this, they had constructed this, this world mythology. It was already in existence. It was offered to the, the publisher before the... I know. Uh, uh, and this, the, this mythology and the Eldar and the... The Valar and the Western Paradise and the Elves and the Dwarves and so on, they don't, uh, they don't arise the first time in this book. They'd already been constructed. There's nothing in the, any of the, in the appendices referred to that hasn't already been written. To. So you had some sort of scheme on which it was possible to work? Well, an immense saga, yes. Well, rather, it that they got, it got sucked into it, as the Hobbit did itself. You see, the Hobbit was originally not you know, about it at all, but as soon as it got moving out into the world, it, it got moving, it sucked into it. So your characters and your story really took took charge. I say took charge. I don't mean that you were completely under their spell or anything of this sort. Oh no 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 no! no. I don't walk about uh, dreaming at all. No, <laughs> bit, no no no! It doesn't uh, an obsession anyway. Other people have had uh, written large things. They were the same sensation that um, you have sometimes. Maybe a purely psychological um, delusion. But you have a sensation that. Um, but at this point. A, B, C, D, only A, one of them is right, and you've got to wait till you see. Well, of course, that's no doubt uh, subconscious goes on working on these things. Anyway, it's no good trying to, uh, <laughs> to anticipate, because all the things I've tried to write ahead of time just to direct myself all proved to be no good when you got there. A story like that has to be written backwards as well as forwards. This is, I thought, probable, yes. Well, you see, Boromir, well, he had to be put back if Boromir could came in at a certain point, but of course he, he, he had to be put right back into the in the book one. Of course, I had maps, of course. You mu if you're going to have a complicated story, you must work to a map, otherwise you can never make a map of it afterwards. The moons, I think, finally, uh, the moons and suns have worked out according to what they were in this part of the world in 1942, actually. They must have something where they... 
I mean, one, I couldn't, I'm not a good enough mathematician or astronomer to work out where they might have been 7,000, 8,000 years ago, but as long as they correspond to some real configuration of what was good enough. Moons are much more tricky to deal with than suns, of course. But on the whole, I don't think the moon is full or rise in the wrong place. You began in 42, did you, to write it? Oh, no, I began in 30, as soon as the Hobbit was out, in the 30s, you know. And when did you... It was finally finished just before it was published, I wrote in the last 54. Thing about 1949, I think. I remember blotting... I remember the... the I actually wept at the, at the feel of Cormalin, where, of course, his, the tears come easier, I think, with... At the, at the good day, no more. Thing. But uh, then, of course, it was a tremendous re revision. I typed the whole of that work out twice, and lots of it many times, on a bed in an attic. Because I couldn't afford the um, cost of the typing. There were some mistakes, too. And also, what I amuses me to say, because I suppose I'm in a position which it doesn't matter what people think of me now, <laughs> some frightful mistakes in grammar from a professor of English language, literally rather shocking. Yeah. I haven't noticed any. There was one where I used bestrode as a past past of bestride. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of things like that, yeah. Will you ever correct them in another edition? Or well, I have sent you some corrections, but they always seem to be new ones cropping up. Yes, there are some. And, of course, dwarves are really mistaken grammar, of course. I've tried to cover it up, but... But it's just purely the fact that uh, I have a tendency to uh, to increase the number of these vestigial approvals, which is a change of constant, like leaf leaves. My tendency is to make more of them uh, than, uh, than are now standard. And I find I really thought dwarf dwarves, dwarf dwarves, why not? Did you evolve the languages before you wrote the book? Oh, yes. Yes. Well, yes, I evolved them a little. I mean, indeed, long before. In fact, they, they began before the fall of the mythology. For what purpose? Just for fun? Expressing, expressing one's own tastes. After all, isn't that what artists do? Of course, but you see, an artist paints a picture presumably for himself, but occasionally with communication in mind. Had you invented these languages with any sense of communication with other people? No, but I hope to find one I found it in the book. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Of course, it's not uncommon, you know. It's mostly done by boys. It's frowned on because they get a guilt complex about it because it's taking off their time from something else. An enormously greater number of children have a, a, what you might call a creative element in them than is usually supposed. And it isn't necessarily limited to certain things. They may not want to paint or draw, they may not have much music, but they nonetheless want to create something. And if the, the main mass of education takes linguistic form, it will take, the creation will take linguistic form, even if it isn't one of their talents, won't it? It's so extraordinarily common. I once did think that oh, it's an awful pity that it ought to be some organised research it, I think. Be very fascinating, not only from the point of view of, uh, of art education and impact of education on that part, which would be fascinating from that point of view, but it's extraordinarily interesting in getting a large uh, body of, uh, of records of the linguistic predilections of children at certain ages. Do you feel any sense of guilt at all that as a philologist, as a professor of English language, with which you were concerned with the factual sources of language, you devoted a large part of your life to a fictional thing? No, no, I thought it done language a lot of good, yes. <laughs> no, I, I, no, no, there's quite a lot of linguistic wisdom in it. I don't feel any guilt complex about the Lord of the Rings, as many people have said. Now we know what you've wasted, wasted the last 14 years of Upon, you can now get on and complete some of those professional tasks which you've neglected. And so, immediately after I died, I was more busy working at my proper things than I'd been for a long while. Yes. Is the book to be considered as an allegory? No. no. I just like allegory whenever I smell it. Do you consider the world declining as the third age declines in your book? And do you see a fourth age for the world at the moment? Our world? Well, the person of my age, you see. He's exactly the kind of person who's uh, lived th through one of the most quickly changing periods of uh, known to history. And that the world is a totally different place now, at a speed where everybody feels that. Uh, anybody who lives over 70 begins to feel that uh, all through history. You can see that they do. But surely they've never been in 70 years so much change. Oh, surely never. No, this, I mean, one doesn't have to be 70 years old to appreciate this. The world which I brought up as a small child was indefinitely closer to the world, say, of Shakespeare. Uh, there's an autumnal quality throughout the whole of The Lord of the Rings. There's a sense of continuous change. Each character feels himself to be part of a story that's forever continuing. You, in one case, 
um, a character says the story is continuing, but I seem to have dropped out of it. Yeah. Um, however, everything is declining and it's fading, at least towards the end of the Third Age. Every choice tends to the upsetting of some tradition. Now, this seems to me to be somewhat like Tennyson's The Old Order Changeth, Yielding Place to New, and God Fulfills Himself in Many Ways. Where is God in The Lord of the Rings? He mentioned once or twice. Is he the one about the elder? The one, yeah, the one, yeah. Despite the continuous war between evil personified in Sauron and good, you never personalise or personify goodness. Good is there, but it's totally abstract. You don't attempt to ascribe any, any um, godship to it, particularly. No, 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 no. it isn't a dualistic uh, mythology is based on, no. no, certainly not. But, I mean, the whole book is nevertheless nothing but the battle between good and evil. Well, that's, I suppose, an actual conscious reaction from a war, from the stuff that I was brought up in a war to end wars, that kind of stuff, which I didn't believe in at the time, and I believe in less now. If I can take this a bit further, you, you, I may make my point clearer. In battle, Frodo and Sam call on Galadriel, or their native country. Gimli calls on the ans his ancestor's axe, if I read your appendices correctly. And the men call only on their swords by name, or on their kings or lords. I would expect them to call on their gods, and yet amid thousands of names, you don't name the deities of any of the races you've invented. Why? Have they no gods as such? There aren't such? any. I would have thought a story of this sort was almost dependent upon an intense belief in some theocratic division, some hierarchy. There is indeed, but that's where the theocratic hierarchy comes in. The man of the 20th century uh, must, uh, of course, see that you must have, whether you believe in them or not, you must have gods in a story of this kind. But he can't make himself believe in gods like Thor and Odin, Aphrodite, uh, Zeus and that kind of thing. You can't believe that the men in your story would have called on Odin. I couldn't possibly construct a mythology which had uh, Olympus or Asgard in it, on the terms in which uh, the people who worshipped those gods believed in. God is supreme, the creator, outside, uh, transcendent. But the, the place of the, uh, of the gods is taken, so well taken, I think, it, that it really makes no difference to the ordinary reader. It's taken by the angelic spirits, created by God, but created before the particular time sequence which we call the world, which is called in the language Ea, that which is, that which now exists. Those are the valor, the power. It's a construction, which is a mythology in which a large part of the demiurgic uh, thing has been, has, has been handed over to powers who are created there in, under the one. It's something like, but much more elaborate and more thought out than uh, C.S. Lewis's business when he's uh, out of the side of the planet where you have a... where you have a demiurgos who's acting command of the of the planet Mars. And the idea there was that Lucifer was originally the, the one in command of the world, but he fell. So it was the silent planet because it had fallen out of that was the idea. Well, this is not the same with me. Yes, yes. So then you have, in your theocracy, you have an ultimate one yeah. whom you call... It's called the one only. The, the one only. Yeah. And then the Valar, yeah. who are considered as living in Valinor. This particular little group of them who, uh, who uh, were moved from other parts of the universe to, to this part because they became interested in it. In the book, you, I get the impression you always see power as being physically in a high place. You have a high seat. There's Orthanc, um, Medusel, Baradur, the towers of Minas Tirith, Morgul and Kirith Angol. They are always high, physically up. Is power for you always, so to speak, at the top of a mountain or top well, of a Well, that's just a symbol, isn't it? Oh, no, as a matter of fact, it's just a story to anything. You want uh, towers and so on that could have them down the dungeon or underneath it. They are, back in fact, Morgoth, the prime mover of evil, of whom Sauron was only a petty lieutenant, lives in a dungeon. He must be in a fortress or of some kind. Not that the not that Valinor has any high towers, just of... Well, that is almost without the world you describe, isn't it? It's in the physical world, according to the myth. Ah. Until the downfall of Atlantis. I have an Atlantis complex in addition to all these other things. And quite independent of that, I have a permanent uh, way, uh, dream that I had, you know. Uh, let's say that uh, the, the ineluctable wave has been one of my nightmares. Sometimes coming in over the open country, it always ends by one surrendering oneself. And one wakes up, but uh, it comes in all kinds of points. I, whenever I used to doodle and draw, it's nearly always a lone figure with the. Vast oceanic wave coming in. 
So, of course, I had to write quite independent of these Atlantic stories, in which I call Numenor, which means the land of the stream where Western is. Well, this is the fable, you see. Since the whole question of the human fall is left off the stage, naturally. It occurred, but they're not known these, since they regraced these people. They were given this great island, the first of all West, not in the, in the divine world, not in the immortal world, to live on. And then, of course, will always come a seemingly meaningless band, like the fruit of the tree of evil. Lewis used the same thing <coughs> in his Perilandra. Their band was they mustn't sail west. They did. Hence the ultimate downfall. It then became only intellectual. It lived then only in memory. It lived in time and not present time. And of course, Numenor was drowned and the earthly paradise was removed. And so then you could then get to South America. I told you the world became round. It always had been a vast globe, but, they, but, people, but people could now sail around, discovered it around. That was my uh, solution of the thing. So I also wanted to give the fall of the dentist some universal application. The point is, really, I've written some story about it, in which as they get to the, you suddenly see the, the real coverage of the world going down like a bridge. You're on a line which leads to what was. Of course, you, I don't know what your theory of time is, but what was, what is, <laughs> if it ever had an existence, must, still has that same existence. But there's, it's a, we won't go to, you can't go too deeply in those things, but they really are sailing back to a to world of memory. In this world which you might have created, had you been given the power to do so, had you been one of the valor, had you been save the mark God. Um, would you have created a world which is so solidly feudal as, it, as the Lord of the Rings? Oh, yes, very much so, yes, yes, yes. I think the feudal... I mean, uh, you mean feudal... Uh, in the widest in sense. In the sense, not in the uh, strict way. Oh, no, 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 in the widest sense. Hierarchical, rather, yes. Hierarchical, exactly, yes. Yes, yes I think so. I mean, that, that power should descend by a line of kings to their oh, sons. This sort heredity, of thing. yes, yes, yes. I don't know about that. No, it's, it's, it's a very potent uh, story-making and emotive thing, but um, how far would say does it really work better than any other system in, uh, in looking at the history of the world, one doubts pretty much. It's never been worse, at any rate, than the, than the, 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 the struggle for power that always ensues when you haven't got some line of descent which can't be, can't be questioned. Yeah. You're, you're, you're wedded to the feudal system, in a sense. Not, I don't mean the, the medieval feudal system, but the idea of, of, of power descending through, through um, blood or through marriage. Or yes, I'm rather ready to those kind of loyalties because uh, I think, contrary to most people, I think that um, touching your cap the square may be damn bad for the square, but it's damn good for you. Do you find a continuing interest in The Lord of the Rings by people? people do people still write to you, on, or despite the fact that the book's been out for ten years? Dozens of letters a week, yeah. Or have to keep a secretary to answer them, yeah. Were you surprised at, at its success? Nobody would be more staggered, you know. <laughs> Unless it was possibly Sir Stanley Arnold. I was up at uh, Stanley Arnold's um, birthday celebration and a, a bookseller came up to me. I don't usually be greeted with such fervor. He said that I'd, uh, while he got <laughs> copies, it sold so well he practically kept him going for a while. <laughs> well, he gets his guinea off the set, you see. Almost the last question. Um, do you, in fact, believe yourself, not in the context of this book, but believe in the sense of straightforward, strict belief, in the Eldar or in some form of um, governing Well, the Eldar mustn't be distinguished from the Valar. The Eldar only... Uh, the Valar, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, Are you, in fact, a theist? Oh, I'm a, I'm a Roman Catholic. Devout Roman Catholic, yes, but uh, I don't know about angelology. Yes, I should have thought almost certainly. I, I mean, they, they, yes, certainly. Well, they seem to me to be the saints, or the equivalent of the saints. Well, they are in some way, yes. They, yeah. they take the place in this book of the uh, things which in, in medieval and older legends you have the gods and, uh, and the invocation of the saints, which are lesser angels. It says. Yes, they do. <laughs> oh, well, of course, obviously many people have noticed that the being to the Lady of the Queen of the Stars is almost like Roman Catholic of invocations of Our Lady. Do you wish to be remembered chiefly by your writings on philology, on other, other matters, or by the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit? I shouldn't have thought there was very much choice in if I remember at all. It would be by the Lord of the Rings, I'd take it. Uh, I wouldn't mind the other being remembered, but I am conscious of the... the small and not very important. Won't it be rather like the case of Longfellow, won't it? They remember, people remember Longfellow wrote Hiawatha and perhaps one or other things. They quite forget he was a professor of modern languages. <laughs>